Hello, Internet, and welcome to day two at the Maxon booth here at SIGGRAPH 2023. I'm here with an amazingly talented artist, and we have them throughout the day. So if you're tuning in, stay tuned in. Now, the good news is we do have the recordings. They will be up, but you can catch us live here right now. Kicking us off for day two, we have the amazing Jacob Dalton. All right. Thanks, Matthias. Um, so yeah, like he said, my name is Jacob Dalton. I'm a 3D VFX artist based in Southern Oregon. I've been in the industry for around 10 years or so. Um, I got my start doing wedding videos and random YouTube content, probably like a lot of us in this space. Uh, but yeah, let me, uh, no, actually I, w I went on from there to work for a company called Video Copilot. And the reason I bring that up is because while I was there, I worked on a project for THX, which was my first foray into using Cinema 4D and Redshift and all things Maxon. And I fell in love with the software, and it's been able to uh, enhance my workflow and allow me to create a lot of cool things uh, over the last handful of years since then. So let me play my reel so you guys can get a better idea of what I do. <laughs> So yeah, lots of fun, a bunch of cool projects in there that, uh, you know, everything's from uh, TV, movies, uh, advertising, eSports. You probably saw some Rocket League. I don't know if anybody plays, but feel free to hit me up after the show. We'll exchange discords, get a couple rounds in. Um, if you saw me last year in uh, NAB at 2022, uh, you probably recognize a lot of familiar projects, both on the reel and what we're talking about today. Uh, I've had a pretty busy year so far, working on lots of cool projects. This one was one of my favorites. Maybe we'll get to that next year. But for now, we're staying in uh, familiar territory, uh, which brings me to the topic of today, which I called VFX trickery. And the reason I called it that is because it's kind of interesting how visual effects is often similar to regular magic, where you're trying to convince your audience or your viewer that something happened that couldn't really happen in real life, right? And oftentimes, you're doing that through a number of techniques, some of them outside the box and clever, and some of them uh, are going to just be simple and maybe even close to dumb. But uh, you're trying to do that in a way that sometimes is leaning more on your audience's expectations of what it is that they're going to see rather than adhering to reality. I grabbed a couple funny examples off the internet of what I mean. Maybe someone saw this of like they're using the cheese and the glue to get it to stretch right in the food commercial because uh, for some reason that makes it look more appetizing. Um, or like this one from Spider-Verse uh, where you got Miles jumping off the building and uh, they pulled out to this witness cam, and they've clearly distorted New York like insane to get that vertigo feeling in their shot. And again, you're leaning in towards shot composition and audience expectations of what they're seeing compared to uh, adhering to reality. Uh, there's this one that went viral recently on Twitter uh, from this Disney animator. Uh, it's from Encanto. I wonder if any of you guys saw this, where he shared this witness cam. I think the character's name's Maribel, and he had to like distort her arms insane to get the shot that he was after. Um, and uh, I was reminded of this. It showed up on Reddit. And I was like, oh, man, how cool. And we got the top comment here from a guy, uh, Mr. Azabatch Dog. He says, uh, it doesn't matter how you got it, so long as it looks good on the camera when you're done. And I think those are words to live by. He's uh, spitting straight facts. Um, but uh, I'm hoping I can show you guys some examples today of projects uh, I've had in my own career over the last couple years where I've had to come up with interesting solutions to sometimes simple, sometimes more complex problems. So let's just jump right into the first example, and I'll play that video for you, and we'll talk a little more about it. Things are a little 
Skippy up there. Don't worry, it's playing smooth on my screen, so I can see it okay. So this project was done as a partnership with a company called Production Crate. They offer lots of really cool assets, everything from 3D models, sound effects, stock footage. And uh, I did this with, uh, I got to give him a quick shout out. My, uh, my good friend Josiah, he's a director, lives over in New York. Uh, we create a lot of projects together, so give him a follow if you want to see cool stuff. But uh, yeah, this first example, I was hoping to kind of turn it into a little bit of a beginner tutorial and just walk you through handling one of these shots from beginning to end and some of the tools that we have in Cinema 4D to make that a lot easier on ourselves. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into After Effects where most of my projects start. Uh, I've got my shot here. Uh, I think this costs somewhere in the range of half a million dollars for this tripod and this cardboard box. Very high tech. We're just trying to get the actor's eye line correct. Obviously, I'm kidding. But um, normally, when I'm planning on bringing a shot from After Effects to cinema, we'll 3D track it. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But I know, just from looking at this shot, that we don't have any like translating through space movement with our camera. Everything is locked on and just rotating on what's called a nodal pan. So we're going to be able to just work on a single still frame in Cinema 4D and bring that back into After Effects and track it in in 2D. So before I leave After Effects, I actually want to save out a reference frame to bring into Cinema to help us line up our camera a little easier. So to do that, we're going to go to Composition, Save Frame as File. We're going to choose our destination folder, change this from Photoshop to PNG, and choose our destination and hit Render. I'm not going to hit Render on After Effects on a live demo. That's just asking for trouble. But let's jump over to Cinema. And I've already got that frame exported. So uh, I'm going to create a new project. First thing I'm going to do is create my background object, which you can find here under this little globe looking tab. Click and hold, grab your background. And this is going to look for a material to be assigned to it. To find our materials, by default, that little box is hidden underneath this icon up here in the top right. So select that. And these are where our materials live. If we double click in this space, it's going to create a standard material by default. Or is my, uh... oh, look at that. We created a redshift material. That's totally fine. We want to create a new standard material. There we go. Double click on your standard material, and we're going to uh, disable reflectance. We don't need it. We just want the color. I'm going to navigate really quick to my reference frame that I exported. I'll drag that right in here to the texture slot. It's going to ask if I want to create a copy of it. I'm just going to click no for the sake of file management. Um, and then we can drag this little material ball directly to our background to see it in cinema. So that's looking pretty good. Next, let's go ahead and create a plane and a camera with this button here. Click this one to uh, pilot our camera. And we're going to orient it and put this roughly on the floor where we would imagine our drone would be. Since this is just a still frame in this particular instance, we don't need to be too precious about uh, focal length or about like specific placement of the plane. As long as it looks good to our eye, chances are it's going to look good to other people's eyes as well. Um, so yes, we've placed our camera. And if you work in 3D, you'll know that sometimes you get your camera exactly where you want it. You forget that you're piloting it. And you start working on your scene, and you accidentally move your camera. So uh, before I do anything else, I like to right click, go to rigging tags, and add a protection tag. And that just stops me from being able to accidentally reposition my camera. So all right, we've got that figured out. Now it's time for us to bring in our drone asset. Uh, the drone asset, like I mentioned, is from a company called Production Crate. They've got lots of really great stuff on there. And when you're working on a project that it requires you, like a lot of projects for artists these days, to wear many hats, you kind of have to do everything from ideation to animation, lighting, render, compositing. And if you can save yourself time on one of those steps um, by sourcing assets uh, or other techniques or corner cutting, like I'm always a big proponent of that. Uh, there's this artist that I, uh, I'm a big fan of. His name's Ian Hubert. And he has this quote from an old tutorial where he was animating cars on an overpass. And he said, you know, you can model a car, but chances are 
someone's already beat you to it. And I think that's a really simple and effective way of putting like, hey, use assets, they're there, they're made by professionals. And uh, yeah, so I've got this drone. I can drag this directly into Cinema 4D. And if I do that, it's going to create a, a fresh project. In this instance, that's not what I want. I want to bring it into my pre-existing scene. So a quick tip is if you just hold Shift while dragging in an uh, object, it looks the same in the dialog, but when it's done, it's imported into your scene directly. So uh, that's a, uh, a button I like to use a lot. We're not going to be too precious about this for sake of time, but I'm just going to place this drone loosely where I want it to be. And now we need to create our Redshift material for the drone. Uh, the first step in doing that is changing our renderer. By default, if we click our render settings, we are in standard. We need to click this drop down and change it to Redshift. So that's going to allow us to use uh, Redshift lights, cameras, materials, uh, and uh, Cinema is going to know what to do with them. So I'm going to double click in here now. It's going to create a Redshift standard material. If I double click this material, we are now in the node view where we have our standard material connected to our output and we need to bring in our PBR textures. Uh, most of the time, if you're sourcing an asset via, say, a CG Trader, Turbo Squid, it's going to come with a set of PBR materials. And knowing what to do with those unlocks a lot of abilities in 3D, because you can start sourcing other people's work and uh, get to a higher quality final product than if you had to make everything yourself. So I'm going to just select all five of these and drag them out here into my node view. And then we just need to go about connecting them. Um, fortunately, this is a little bit straightforward for us, where everything has its name accordingly. So my base color, if I click this little dot and I drag it to the blue corner of my standard material, and I go to base, I can connect it to the base color. And the same thing for the roughness here. We can drag our roughness into the, let's see, reflection roughness. Metallic goes to, it's being a little bit slow here. Um, where do we put the reflection metalness? <laughs> Excuse me, there it is, metalness under base. Um, and then we have our opacity, which I can ignore for now because that's for glass. I'll just delete that. And we have our normal. Uh, the normal is a little bit different compared to the rest of our textures because we actually need to bump it into a bump map first. So if I just type in bump in the search window, drag this out, I'll connect first my normal to the Redshift bump texture input, and then I'll connect the bump input to our standard node. Underneath geometry, bump input. Uh, two more things we need to do to the bump before we exit out of this node view. Uh, the first is selecting our bump node and changing it from a height field to our tangent space normal. Uh, since this weird purple looking map that we drug in here, uh, this one is a normal map. It's not a bump or a height map. So we need to inform Cinema 4D that that's what we're using. So tangent space normal. Uh, and then next, I'm actually going to change the drone normal texture from auto to raw in its color space. And that's just going to allow it to work a lot better. So OK, we've got our material set up, and we need it to be applied to our drone. Now, if we look at how many pieces our drone has and how many instances of this material exist, um, it can be a bit overwhelming thinking about, like, OK, I need to like apply this to all of this. Um, a very quick shortcut to do that is just select your material hold Alt and drag it on top of the old one. And that's just going to swap and replace. So it applies to every single piece. There it is. So that works out nicely. Uh, the next thing that we need to do is add in our lighting. Uh, Redshift allows you to use an HDRI to light your scene, which works very nicely. Um, I downloaded a couple HDRIs from a free resource called HDRI Haven. Uh, they're a super awesome resource. They've got textures. They've got models. Um, I highly recommend you check them out if you haven't seen them before. Um, but this is what an HDRI typically looks like. It's a 360-degree map of an, of an environment. Usually it's 32-bit, so the brightness of the sun or any other light sources can be carried over to your scene. Um, 
So I'll just drag this specific HDRI into my project. And also, for sake of accuracy, I'm just going to swap to the uh, actual project from the uh, video itself, where the drone's lined up. So I've got my dome light here. Once you add your dome light, by the way, it's under here where you go to light, dome light. I'll just delete that new one. Under the object panel, there is a texture input. So I'll select this little folder. And I'll navigate to my project folder, where my HDRIs are. And I'll grab this one, the little Paris. Select no again, because we don't want to create a copy. And let's check out how this looks in our render view. So again, we go up to Window and choose Redshift Render View. And that's going to allow us a small little preview window to see what this looks like at the time of export. Um, and if you notice, it looks terrible. What the heck? What happened? Our drone had this harsh shadow. The color temperature doesn't match at all. Um, you know, we can rotate this HDRI and change which direction the shadow's coming from. But uh, we clearly didn't choose well for our HDRI. Uh, if you didn't get the opportunity with uh, being on set to shoot your own, or if someone provided you footage and they didn't shoot an HDRI or a 360 map while they were there, Oftentimes, it can be really helpful to try and source one that at least looks as close as possible to your original shooting location. I found this one, which was overcast, and it's in a dirt field, and it's going to match our scene nicely. So let me just swap out which HDRI I'm using really quick to this suburban field. And immediately, we have something that looks a lot more conducive to the lighting of our actual scene. It matches our character a little bit better. And uh, we can go from there. A couple more things I want to show you. Uh, this ground plane has a very clean and uniform shadow, where in real life it would be very bumpy. Um, so a quick way to do that is to add a random effector. So to search in Cinema 4D, you hit Shift-C to bring open this little window. And I'll just type in random. This one at the top, random MoGraph drag it into uh, your plane as a child. I'm going to uh, stop our uh, IPR window here just so I don't crash anything. Minimize that for now. And we're going to go to the deformer of our random effector and change this to point. And we blew it up. And that's totally fine. We just need to pull back the strength on the effector tab to somewhere around like 1%. And that's going to make our shadow look a lot more irregular. And some of the bits that we're going to see in our composite are going to blend just that much nicer. Now, I don't want to see our plane like this. We actually need to make it a matte shadow in order to bring this out of Cinema 4D and into After Effects. So in order to do that, I'm going to select our plane, right click, go to Render, and add a Redshift Material tag. The Redshift Material tag has this slot called Matte. So if we go over there, enable Override, the General, and our Shadow, you can see it's now disappeared, but it's allowed us to keep our shadow on the ground. Uh, however, if we change from RGB to Alpha, you can see we're still going to render with a solid plane. And it, we're not quite there to what we want yet. We have to click one more button down here called Effects Alpha. So once we turn that on, now we're going to be able to export out properly. And we will uh, have a lot easier time compositing this into our scene. So in order to export this, we need to come up here to our render settings. First, let's make sure the width and height matches what we were working with in After Effects. And under the Save tab, we need to make sure that we select a format that supports alpha. I'm using an EXR, uh, but you could also use a PNG uh, or you know, what have you. But EXR is usually my go-to. Make sure alpha channel is enabled. And your redshift uh, bucket quality, by default, is usually set to medium. 90% of the time, I don't need to touch this. Medium works just fine. Uh, I really like when they added these presets in, because before, what we were doing is uh, playing with the actual samples min and max, and we needed to set these manually. Um, but now, we just have these uh, very handy low, medium, and high tabs. Um, so medium is going to work just fine. We can click Render and send this out to an EXR. Uh, now, back in After Effects, I'll show you what that looks like really quick. We have, under our renders, our drone straight from Cinema. And if we drag this in on top of our footage, yeah, it looks OK. But we've got one big issue here with the ground. 
it doesn't quite blend the way we would want it to. And this is where one of those like funny corner cutting solution comes in, where instead of spending more time in 3D, finding more assets, building those, and maybe replacing part of the ground and doing it the brute force way, I actually just found these little assets on Production Crate. Again, shout out to them uh, of these plants. And if you go to my actual final composite, I've laid a bunch of them out in here, color corrected them to match my ground, and now you don't have to look at that ugly seam. You just get a hint of that ambient occlusion showing beneath, and we've hidden our sins beneath uh, some clever assets. Uh, you can see in the final video here, I'll just play it back, down here on the ground. And it's funny because with visual effects, sometimes your goal is to misdirect people. Um, those plant assets, those aren't the hero of this shot. They're actually there because I don't want you to look in that area of the frame. So again, another parallel you can draw with a regular old magic trick. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and jump from that quick VFX comp example into a similar project with uh, a little bit more of a complex setup. So let's see. I've got this one here, which was an advertisement for a company called Control, which does like gaming nutrition. So there was a Warzone ad that we did where we had these guys like hop on a helicopter. Um, and rather than playing the full video for you, I'll just play the little breakdown so you get an idea of what it took to pull the shot off. Also, if anyone's seen Black Hawk in real life, don't tell the people next to you that this one is scaled completely incorrectly. I just needed my guy to stand in there, and uh, hopefully no one notices. But we have uh, the exact same steps from our previous shot, just with a couple other things that we needed to do to get this set up. So I'll walk you through that really quickly. Let me navigate to that project. Don't need to save that. Let's go to our demo scenes, helicopter. I think I put it right here. There we go. Just like before, we're starting out in After Effects with our footage. We have our guys here, and they run up and uh, jump on this wood pile. Again, very high tech. That wood pile was, uh, really broke the budget. And uh, I know I need to 3D track this to bring this over into Cinema 4D. And fortunately, uh, After Effects makes that really easy. So if I select my footage here, I can come over here into the effects and presets and type in, oh, once that loads, 3D camera tracker, drag this out on top, and that's going to start processing. Um, for sake of time, I already let that process beforehand. So I've got this clip here with our camera tracker. When your camera tracker finishes, um, you have all of these little X's all over the place on key areas. So you can select those. And I'll actually just delete these really quick. Uh, you can select a big group of them to take the average. Right click and choose Create Solid in Camera. So that creates a solid that's locked to your footage, um, as well as uh, Looks like the track's a little shaky. Don't worry about it. This is, it's all pre-planned. Um, as well as uh, a, a camera that matches the movement of your actual footage. So what I'm going to do really quick before leaving is just show you what I did in the original, which is grab a couple other key reference areas I knew I was going to want. So back here on the log, and maybe up here over on the front of the log. So we have these solids. And um, I'm not sure what I did sliding this around to make this so shaky. Ah, we were off by a frame. That's what happened. Um, so we have these solids, and we have our camera. In order to bring this over into Cinema 4D, uh, it's actually very simple. We just come up here to File, go to Export, and choose Maxon Cinema 4D Exporter. Um, typically, this process takes just a little while, so don't be scared if it's taking a minute to load, especially if you're working on anything higher than 1080p. Uh, 4K footage setting up that cinema file uh, usually will take upwards of two, three minutes. But once that's finished in After Effects, it's going to ask you to save your cinema file, which uh, fortunately, we don't have to wait. Uh, oh yeah, you typically get this error. I'll warn you in case you're doing this at home. Um, it just tells you that there are 2D layers in your scene that it didn't bring to your cinema project. It left those behind, and that's, uh, that's very normal. So anyway, we just click OK, we save our cinema project, and we can go ahead and go open that one, which I have right here. You can see we have our three planes and our tracked camera. 
Some of the benefits of exporting this way are that your project frame rate is set, your frames on your timeline match your footage, and your output resolution and frame rate already match your footage as well. So things are just like set up and ready to go for you. And just like our previous example, it's kind of the same exact steps. We're creating a ground plane. We're distorting it a little bit to match what happens uh, in the actual live action plate. We're bringing in an asset. And we are using an HDRI to light it and using the matte shadow feature and uh, all the way through. So this is what that looked like, getting that set up. And I'll show you really quick, just for the sake of example, what that render looked like. Coming straight out of Cinema, this ground plane um, was uh, from Megascans. Uh, it's a really great resource for high quality like nature assets, and they've got a bunch of stuff there. Um, I'm pulling this up to show you how harsh this cutoff edge underneath the helicopter is. We need a way similar to our last project to blend that scene into our footage. And the way that I'm going to do that is the exact same way as before. We're just going to cover that with some assets. Um, if we go reference this breakdown again, you can see I've got this whole pass here of all the various hodgepodge of assets that I put together to cover that seam. Pardon it rendering so quickly here, but um, the main thing that I wanted to talk about on this project that I thought you guys might get a kick out of was creating this leaf asset where everything's blowing towards the camera. The rest of this was all 2D and able to be tracked in... Uh, uh, was, was able to be just composited in After Effects. But the leaves were actually like translating through space through them, and they're flying past the camera. So I knew that that needed to be a custom 3D asset. So I'll show you how we set up those leaves in Cinema 4D really quick, um, just because I thought the, the new cloth system was able to handle that super well. So I'll go ahead and I'll create a new project for us really quick and close this one. I don't need it. And I'm going to navigate over towards where I have my Leaf Atlas. So I'm going to come here to my demo scenes, the helicopter, leaves, and my textures. OK. This uh, also was from Megascans. And I'll show you how we turn this into a Leaf particle system, because right now it's just a flat card. Let's first create a plane. Then we're going to drag out the opacity. The reason I'm using that is because it's got the most contrast, and it's easy to see where the outlines of the leaves are. So I'll just put this here. I'm going to say no. And we can see this from the top. I'm going to double click this material and turn off reflectance, just so I can see it even that much easier. And we're going to select a couple of these leaves to chop out. And uh, we don't need them all. We just need a few variations. So to do that, I'm going to hit C to make my plane editable grab my edge tool up here at the top, and then right click anywhere on this surface and select my line cut tool. And this is just going to be like a garbage mat in any other piece of software. We're just going to draw a little outline around a couple of these key leaves. So that one looks good. And uh, how about we just grab this one over here? I used like six in the uh, original project, but we'll just do two, uh, two for sake of time. All right. So once you've got those chopped out, and we've created a bunch of ugly end gons, we don't need to worry about making it clean. We just need to get rid of what we don't need. So let's select our polygons at the top, as well as our brush tool over here on the left, which I like. It's very handy. You can just draw what you want. And I'll select this, hold Shift, and select this one too. Then I'll use a handy shortcut UI on the keyboard to invert my selection. And then I'm going to hit Delete. And I'm left with just the leaves that I wanted. Now, I'm also going to hold Control and drag this plane to duplicate it. So there are now two copies. And for this top one, we'll just delete the top leaf. And for the bottom one, we'll delete the bottom leaf. So now they're on their own layers, one and two. Um, I also really quick want to recenter their anchor points so they're not rotating around the center. So I'll select them both come up here to Tools, go to Axis, and choose Center Axis 2. So now our leaves uh, have their center points correct. And we just need to build out the Redshift material, just like we did with the uh, drone, where we have our uh, base color, which in this case is named the albedo, ambient occlusion, normal, opacity, and roughness. Um, for sake of time, I'm not going to show you how to build another Redshift material. We just did that. Um, I will open the node layout so at least you can see. So let me go to the helicopter leaves. And I'm just going to grab all six of these from the original example and just paste them in here. 
Bear with me for a second. We just need to save this under demo scenes. Where's my helicopter? Leaves. We'll just overwrite this demo project. Call that OK. Uh, we also need to, since this is a Redshift material, change our renderer from standard to Redshift. So come up here, change the drop down to Redshift. Uh, and now, once this loads, give it just a moment here. We can select all these materials, I mean, select all these objects and center them out. Just add zeros here. And we have a pile of leaves. Now, if it was autumn and uh, this is what we were going for, we could stop here. We just raked them into a pile and we're done. But we need them to be blown by a helicopter, and uh, the way to do that is with a particle system. So I need to create an emitter really quick. Again, Shift-C to search in Cinema 4D. And I'm going to type in emitter, hit Enter. And that's going to bring our emitter into this scene. I need to drag all six of these leaves into the emitter and then go to the Particle tab on the emitter and turn on Show Objects. So if I hit Play here, you can see they're all just kind of being spewed out. And that looks pretty cool, uh, but there's a handful more things we need to do to get this the rest of the way there. Uh, let's create a ground plane for contacts. We'll just make this really big here. And I want to move my emitter up. Actually, let's first let's make it a little bit wider, just like the original example. Uh, and I want to scooch it up so I don't have any leaves spawning under the floor. So let's scooch this up a little bit. And that's looking pretty good. Now let's add some physics. You could do this with the bullet system and rigid body, but you'd be left with flat cards that are bouncing around, and they like a like it's accurately named. They're very rigid, um, and I want them to have some bending and folding and tumbling to them. So instead, I'm going to use the cloth system. So to do that, I'm going to go to plane, right click, go to simulation tags, and choose collider, and then let's go to our emitter, right click, go to simulation tags, and choose cloth. And once these spawn. They're just going to start falling, because now we're no longer honoring the emission speed on our emitter. Uh, we're just letting gravity take over. So let's come up here to simulate and add in some wind. Under forces, add wind. Now by default, your wind is super low at 5 centimeters. So I'm going to just make this like maybe 3,000, see what that looks like. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Uh, we want them to be tumbling some, so let's add in some turbulence as well. Simulate, forces. Turbulence. Let's also make this maybe 3,000. There we go. We have some leaves tumbling. And I'll pause it just so you can see what I mean. If we zoom in here, we have some depth on these planes. They're folding over themselves, and they're not just flat cards anymore. And that's all due to our cloth system. And I was super impressed with this new cloth system because I was originally anticipating needing to do this with rigid body in order for uh, it to accurately process that many leaves in a simulation. But Cinema 4D's new cloth system was able to handle quite a few leaves, uh, and it wasn't really slowing down at all. So I was super impressed with how this was turning out. Um, I think the last thing we need to do to get this to look good is make the ground not so slippery like ice. We want the leaves to not just slide when they hit. We want them to bounce back up and tumble. So I'm going to grab our uh, collider tag on our plane, and I'm going to change the friction from 0.2 to something like 0.95. Um, and so now if we play this, we're getting a lot more chaotic tumbling and a lot less sliding. So. Once we have this finished, we're like, all right, we're happy with our leaves. We can bring this uh, emitter and the system that we built back over to our demo project, where we have our camera tracked and we have um, our ground plane. So it all matches the original footage. And we can export this out as an EXR sequence. I'll show you there's one other thing I wanted to do with this asset, and I knew in advance what the problem was going to be with compositing, is that the leaves are just popping on at the background. They, they go from not being there to being there every frame. And you could have this like kind of like come up over the back, and I was starting to run into like lots of issues of still getting the leaves to like look the way I wanted to, having them start on the ground or having them like come up over the hill behind. So instead, my like, quick solution for this was just to export a depth pass and composite them with some opacity in After Effects.
So really quick, if you want to export out depth with your scene, it's as simple as going to the Redshift render settings, setting a save output for your multipass, going to Redshift, making sure to check Advanced, go to AOV, and then open this AOV Manager. Uh, the AOV Manager allows you to export lots of different passes. Uh, I'll just delete my Z depth so I can show you where it is. It's this one called Depth. Drag this directly in, and now it's going to export with a depth channel. I'll show you what that render looked like in After Effects really quick. Um, I've got my helicopter leaves here, and you can see that they're just sort of popping in in the background, and I want them to fade in. So in order to do that, I'm going to quickly duplicate this, solo the top copy, add an effect called Extractor, and we can change the channel info to show our depth. And what I need to do, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this right now, is just make sure that the ones closer to us are bright and the ones further from us fade into black. And so then that way, what I can do is take this bottom copy and set the track mat to the top copy as a luma mat so it fades on as it comes towards us. Um, now, that's not necessarily realistic, but just like the last project, um, I'm trying to get you to not look at an issue. Um, we're trying to hide it beneath a lot of layers of assets so we can just uh, have the hero of our asset, um, that helicopter, be supported by all of these smaller things. So anyway, that was just like a quick tip, exporting out a depth pass, and I thought those leaves were pretty fun to make, so I wanted to show those off today. Um, moving on, I showed you guys on this project how you can take uh, camera and null data from After Effects and bring that to Cinema 4D. Um, oftentimes, I'm going the other direction. We're thinking backwards here. And uh, we're taking uh, camera and null data that we created in Cinema 4D and bringing that back to After Effects. So I'll show you really quick the project that I'm going to talk about uh, just for fun. And then I'll show you how I set that up. So this was a project for uh, Shopify's Rocket League team. watch some like high level Rocket League gameplay, but we'll stop after the 3D ends. The shot I want to talk about is this one here where I have the ball coming into the middle and exploding. Um, Cinema 4D did recently add in a pyro system, so you can create really cool like fire simulations. I did these tests uh, and I was like playing around with some of the settings trying to get it to look as cool as I could. Honestly, right out of the box, their pyro system is phenomenal. But at the time of this project, this wasn't out yet, and I knew I didn't have a lot of time to go simulate something custom. So just like everything else in this presentation, we're going to lean on using an explosion asset. Now, the reason I think this is notable to talk about is if you are planning on using an asset in your 3D scene, there are things you can do to help it blend in better and be more realistic. So for example, in this particular shot, this ball is going to explode, and there's going to be a fireball right here. Um, if I come up here to window, and hopefully this loads, um, this morning this was taking quite a, quite a while to boot up. So give it just a moment with me. <clears throat> Anybody know any good jokes? Um, OK, so I guess while this loads, oh, there we go. So I have my shot here. And I have my ball that's animated into the goal. And um, at the moment that it's going to explode, I have the ball just disappearing. So I did that with a redshift tag under visibility. I just keyframed all of these to turn off. Um, and where this explosion is taking place, um, if we were to actually put some fire there, it would light up that scene a ton. 
So if I were to just export this as is and plan on compositing later, um, it's going to be hard to get those integrated and looking as like natural in the scene as I want them to. So it's really as simple as just adding in a little light where you're planning on putting your fire or your explosion. So that way, it accurately has something to bounce off in the scene. So I just have this little point light and my redshift environment. And uh, then we need to um, bring this out of cinema and into After Effects. That's going to be our next step. So once we put this light in and everything's animated and we like it the way it looks, uh, the way to bring this out of cinema and into After Effects is using their compositing file export. So the first thing I'm going to do is mark this ball so it shows up in After Effects by right-clicking, going to Render Tags, and choosing this Cineware tag. Uh, and that's all I needed to do. I can come up here to my render settings, go to Save, Compositing Project File, make sure Save is turned on, your target application is set to wherever you're taking it. For me, it's After Effects. Check Include 3D Data and Save Project File. The type of file that this saves is called an AEC file. By default, After Effects can't render AEC files, but Cinema 4D does come uh, pre-installed uh, with Exchange plugins. So you can just like install this free plugin that comes with Cinema called the C4D Importer, and that's going to allow After Effects to read AEC files. So you do this once, and this workflow becomes super viable completely moving forward. So uh, importing this uh, AEC file into After Effects, I'll show you really quick. Excuse me. It looks uh, pretty much exactly as we would expect it to. We have our null for the ball. That's what we chose to mark as our export. And we have our camera. So it's going to be very easy for us to place things in 3D space. And you can also see that raw render, how it turned out with the light turning on and off. So uh, a quick tip in After Effects, if you're wanting to play something into 3D space, uh, we're going to drag out. Uh, let's just grab this aerial explosion. This is from Video Copilot. And we'll place this roughly where we want it in 3D by turning on the 3D switch and holding Shift before parenting it to the ball. And what that's going to do is make the layer jump to the position of that null rather than just be uh, affected by its own movement. So we'll place this here, you know, and you can do a bunch of different stuff to this. We'll set it to like add, maybe screen. We could add some glow to this. Um, this isn't a compositing tutorial, so I'll just breeze past this. We'll go to time, time stretch. I know this needs to be quicker, so we'll have this go off at the moment the ball disappears. And Boom, you've got that in 3D. Now, obviously, that doesn't look ideal. It's kind of clipping through the ground. It needs to go out of focus. And we can layer a lot of different assets in here. Um, if you can see by the uh, original example, uh, I've got a lot more going on than just that one explosion. There's some sparks. There's like a whole shock wave. Looks like something didn't load, but that's OK. I can just show you in Premiere again. Yeah, it's kind of how it works. But I think the main takeaway that I was hoping to show you guys is how this big explosion right here seems to be affecting the environment with that orange light. We're seeing it cast the, the specular on the ground. So always really handy to think ahead like that. Um, OK. Uh, oh, yeah, I did this project with a, with a production company called uh, Paper Crowns. These guys are awesome. Go check them out. Um, uh, oh, also, just because you guys might get a kick out of it, that opening shot <laughs> was actually live action. <laughs> just a little 3D set extension for you. OK. Uh, for my final example, uh, it's very quick. And I'm running almost out of time, so I'm going to need to just breeze right past this. Uh, this was a project I did with a company called Coronation Media. Uh, these guys are super cool. Uh, also, check them out. I, uh, I've been working with them a lot this year. And we did a. Uh, a scene with Unreal Engine. And uh, Unreal Engine now, with the Datasmith plugin from Cinema 4D, has really, really great integration uh, between the two pieces of software. Go check out uh, Jonathan Winbush on YouTube if you want to learn some of that. He's the go-to guy. Uh, but let me just play my project really quick here for you. So, 
some of the sound is uh, still temp, but... So we got this guy, he kind of comes walking into frame. You are no match for me, George of Cappadocia. <laughs> this is the shot in question. The fire behind it. I'm all about using the tools available to make things easier on yourself wherever you can. Uh, like I was talking about earlier, we often wear mini hats while working on projects. And so if you can corner cut and keep the quality high and not overcomplicate, then uh, usually you're going to be in pretty good shape. Uh, like for example on this project, um, him turning and jumping and throwing the spear. Check it out. Here's me on my trampoline <laughs> with some little AI mocap. Not too bad. Um, but yeah, I'll show you uh, the scene layout from Cinema 4D and how that shot turned out. So he's running and turns, jumps, and throws. Whoosh. So exact same as the previous project, we exported out a camera and we exported out a null and we brought those into After Effects uh, for us to be able to composite our fire. So I'm going to have to do that really quick, and then we'll have to wrap up. So OK. I'll show you the raw render here. This is straight from Unreal Engine with that scene I just showed you in Cinema, sent directly to Unreal, and then using their Megascans uh, library, just building it out with a bunch of plants and whatnot. So he runs, and we have our orange light turning on. And if you compare that to the final, the compositing is a little bit more complex than it was on the Shopify project because this needs to integrate with the grass directly and it can't just like live on top of the footage. So in order to do that, let's reference our original render here. And just like before, we're going to add in the extractor effect so we can see our depth. Uh, and then I'm going to use shift channels to remove the blue so we have just like this clean outline. Now, what's cool about this is we can bring in a fire asset. Sorry, I'm trying to go quick. And we can set this to Luma inverted mat to have it show up behind our actor. And we can adjust on the extractor effect our black and white points to seemingly push it further back into the grass or animate it coming forward, which is what we did for the final, because it sort of starts farther behind him and then moves forward as he's running. That's why there's keyframes on here. Um, but yeah, that was, a, that was a really fun project. Uh, I guess I'll just go ahead and get over here to my summary slide, which is that my... <laughs> My philosophy often on working with these projects is to not overcomplicate. If you can get to your end result a more efficient way, I'm often in favor of doing that. Um, a finished project is often better than a perfect one. So anyway, uh, my name is Jacob Dalton. Thank you guys very much for listening. And uh, have a great rest of the Seagraph. Awesome. Excellent job. We do have some time for live questions. So any questions from the audience on Jacob's process or pipeline? Cool. So the nice thing is when you do a good job, they all just <laughs> sit there and they're just I'll like, you know, just another round. All right. So Jacob will be available at the Dell booth. We have a demo station. He'll be there for the next hour. So you'll be able to ask him anything in case you're feeling shy or something just comes to top of mind. Um, but stay tuned. We'll be up with our next presenter in about 10 minutes. The next up is Don Allen Stevenson III. So stay tuned, Internet. Thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone.